talk about is so that Fox has this documentary on Netflix right now. It's called Money Explained. And in the course of this show, they talk about five topics. Uh, each episode is like, like 20 minutes long. And, and they go over um, five different topics that they're just trying to explain to the general pop population, like what's going on um, and why these types of things happen. So the five subjects are financial scams slash crimes, uh, what's to do with credit cards, student loans, retirement, and gambling. Okay, so I'm just going to respond a little bit to this show because I think the show did a pretty good job of diagnosing some of the problems without really offering the types of system changing solutions that someone um, who's sitting in my shoes, both as a socialist and someone with a significant amount of student debt, would want uh, an informative show to, to give people. Okay, so I'm gonna to attempt to kind of break some of that down. So I think the financial scams one is easy. I think part of the reason people fall for financial scams is there is this kind of gut, um, you know, this 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 gut instinct to make more money. Um, I don't think it's a greed thing necessarily. I think it's a systemic thing. Um, they, you know, they talk about an early example of scams. Uh, and they talk about this guy who, essentially created an island, like during the age of discovery, invented an island that didn't really exist, asked lots of people to invest in it, uh, and then, you know, vanished, right, before, um, you know, before he could get caught or whatever. So I, I think this is a fairly easy one to respond to because essentially capitalism and, and mercantilism, which was the system of, the system of economic um, the, the, the economic system back in the day when this initial example that they gave was in what's going on, I think that's just a system that plays on people's fear of poverty and, and you know, and, and things like that. So the idea is like, hey, this is an opportunity to get rich quick and, you know, getting rich or, or, or making money is hard. Like, we have to work. We sell our labor to capitalists or, or mercantilists or whatever to pay rent and to do all these other things to keep ourselves alive. And it's a lot of work, and work kind of sucks. And, like, well, if there's a way that you didn't have to work, you just get rich by, by you know, manipulating the system, then, like, wouldn't it be great? Because then you wouldn't have to work, and you wouldn't have to sell your labor, and, and you could live a happier life, right? There's always been this allure in a system like capitalism to, hey, what can you potentially do to limit the amount of time that you have to sell your work to someone else, okay? So I think that's a fairly easy one to respond to. Um, the next one, which is credit cards. See, the thing, so they did actually talk a lot about uh, kind of the issue with credit cards. They explained different types of credit card users. By the way, before I go on, you actually should watch this series. I actually think it does a great job of diagnosing a lot of the problems in the system. Again, this is about primarily discussing the solutions to some of these problems that they bring up. And by the way, um, I'm going to be pretty repetitive in this segment, so, you know, sorry, I guess. But essentially, the issue with credit cards, which they outline pretty well, is that credit cards and credit as a concept in general is a giant scam, okay? Essentially, they are betting against you. Sure, they're giving you some money, but it's, they, they want you to fail. In fact, it is much better for them if you do fail because when you fail, they make money. The worst people for them are people who, you know, take out a certain amount of money and always pay it back on time and never generate any interest for the company, okay? So... The whole thing is a scam. Partially, by the way, because, and credit card, the other thing that they, they bring up, but I think is important to reemphasize here, is that credit cards essentially replace small term lending. Banks no longer give small loans to people. You know, uh, banks only typically operate in these larger loan spheres because the idea is, well, we can just give them a credit card and they always can take out that loan that's what a credit card is, right? It's just a short, it's a month-to-month -month loan, more or less. And they can always take that out, but hey, 
this time, if they don't pay it back on time, we can gamble against them and we can kind of set up the system in such a way that when they fail, we can make lots of money. And by the way, we can make the, their failing cyclical because they the, the loan is perpetual, right? The balance is always carried over. They can always spend more on it. Whereas if the bank gives you a loan instead and says, here, Ben, here's $500, I only have that five hundred dollars that I can spend. At some point, I have to pay it back, true, and some interest. But the thing is, like, that's a short-term gain for the bank, right? They give me five hundred dollars. I I use it for whatever I want to use it. In theory, I make it back plus a little extra, and I give the bank back. They made a little bit of money, true, but that's the end of the transaction. Nothing else happens. Now, of course, if I default on that loan. They can chase me for it and they might make some more money there. But they've also lost some money because I'm not paying them back, right? With a credit card, they get rid of this issue because the loan follows you forever. They can put interest on it, but they can also encourage you to spend more money even if you don't have that money, which is a lot of what happens with the credit cards. So, which by the way is, is kind of what makes credit cards so very worrisome. But, so why is this all happening, right? Why can banks do this? One, because they're not really regulated in such a way that says they have to make small loans. And two, because even if they were, you might still have the problem of people needing to make small loans over and over and over again. So you could actually have lots of short-term gains for the bank, even if they weren't allowed to essentially substitute credit card issuances for loans, for small loans. Okay. So what is the solution here? How do we get out of this cycle of recurring debt and poverty? Um, well, the government, I, of course, has to regulate these banks a little further to allow for small-time lending to happen. But also, and more importantly, the government has to take steps so that people don't aren't always adjacent to poverty, right? Part of the reason that this issue exists, that people take on so much personal debt, is because we're always adjacent to poverty. Even people who make good salaries, you know, if they have debts or other things that they have to pay off, and there's not a ton of money for them at the end of the month, and they can't save money for a rainy day, which most Americans cannot do, then you get to the issue where they're always adjacent to poverty, where people are just one terrible thing away from being on the street. And this fear drives us to spend money that we don't have, which makes lots of profits for these banks. So an easy solution to this, lots of government investment or UBI, Plus, we need regulations to make sure that these banks are required to either be, um, to be more uh, either be more clear about what they're doing, but also, more importantly, there should be regulations that force banks to give small loans to people, or or if the banks aren't willing to do it, set up the post office as a bank. The, the Bernie Sanders had a postal banking system idea that would give small loans to people. By the way, if you did that, you would undercut credit card companies. One of the reasons that that bill is is destined to fail, unless you know there's some super majority of lefties in there, is because every bank is going to fight against it, and every credit card company is going to fight against it. Because by creating a postal bank, you inherently undermine all of the shenanigans that they pull off, whether it's the lack of small loans thing that I discussed earlier, or or other shenanigans. Um, but the postal bank would be the most successful bank. Not successful, accessible bank in the in the world because essentially every zip code in America has a post office. So every zip code in America would have a bank where you could take out a small loan at a very low interest rate. The government can just print money. It doesn't have to compete with banking rates, right? And it doesn't have to make money. Was the other thing. So this the postal banking is really the solution to the credit card issue. Um, but of course, credit card companies and banks are going to fight against that. So the next, uh, the next part of it that they talk about is student loans. So they do talk about the, 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 um, the changing of the burden for student loans from state governments to individuals and students. Okay, fine, great. That makes sense. Thank you for telling us. Yes, you know, when um, Elizabeth Warren went to school, and I only use her because she has given her college numbers many times and I have them memorized at this point, it costs her $50 a semester, right? Very reasonable. You could make that kind of money working at McDonald's. And by the way, back in the day, many people did. But the reason tuition could be that cheap is because the federal government and state governments poured a ton of money into education. Part of this was because 
we really needed people to have college educations because we were competing with the Soviet Union for educated persons. But at the same time, it was just saw as a it was just seen as a public good. People should be able to go to school for cheap. Now, by the way, this didn't include trade schools. It didn't include um, you know some. Uh, it didn't include some other types of vocational education, apprenticeships, and things like that. So there were definitely gaps in it. And by the way, of course. Which goes without saying, we were talking about the you know the, the the era of time between the 50s and the 90s. Lots of racism. There were lots of times where racism was playing fact was playing into factors as well, and making sure that it was going to be very difficult for non-white people to get in to these schools. Okay, so yeah, so essentially. They diagnose the problem really well. They tell you all about the, how the, the burden has switched to individual borrowers and why it's so difficult and how rates are higher and the federal government makes a ton of money off of student loans, which partially reinforces the issue because the Department of Education essentially relies on most of its budget from its student loans. The federal government's making lots of money off of students, so there's not a ton of pressure to change or worse, to cancel student loans. And you essentially get back to the same problem that you had earlier where the problem is easily diagnosable but the solution is not apparent or they don't say the solution but the solution is actually incredibly easy it's going to be the government spending a shit ton of money but specifically the way they're going to spend that ton of money is they're going to make um all public colleges universities um tuition free uh, and, and debt free so essentially you do not pay to go to school you don't pay for books you don't pay for tuition Hell, you don't even pay for room, board, or food. Okay, you just go and get it, and you get your education totally on the on, on the U.S. taxpayer, which would be great. And by the way, when you do that, you have to wipe clean the student loan slate, obviously. And then you know, then you have a system where you totally erase this problem of student loan debt. And by the way, you should expand it so that it covers vocational schools, assistant apprenticeship programs, and, and other types of educational programs that don't fit into the traditional college hierarchy as we understand it today. This requires a lot of investment. And unfortunately, like all large investments, it's probably not going to go, any, go anywhere under this particular president um, or many uh, presidents because there is always this uh, skepticism about spending lots of money. But as I have said, then who's going to pay for it? But as I have said in past segments, we don't need to worry about that because um, the U.S. has a fiat currency. So modern, mon modern, modern monetary theory is going to take us through here. But essentially, you get to a place where you do not need to worry about student loans anymore because you've eliminated the underlying problems, which is the creation of student loans. Okay. So the next part of this that they tackle is retirement um, and I'm, I'm probably not going to talk about gambling gambling kind of falls under the, the get rich quick type of financial scam things that i was talking about earlier so i will close out today's segment um, with retirement and we'll just go from there okay so and actually uh given our time constraints i'm just going to turn this off the timer off now because we will actually just get through this and then we'll be done so in one second Okay, so essentially, why is retirement so difficult? So we have Social Security, which is great. And they talk, and actually, they go through a lot of detail to talk about, again, you should really watch this series. They go through a lot of detail to talk about kind of where the funding for money comes from. But at the end of the day, there are still some issues. So one is, you know, they don't really offer the solution, which I think is the most obvious, which is to just go back to the pension system, which is to say that companies are on the hook for their retirees. If you retire, having worked for a company for a certain number of years, they have to pay for you to live until you die. Now, companies aren't going to love this, of course, because it, become, it could become very expensive for them, and which is why you've seen pensions mainly go away in favor of 401ks, which rely on the market, by the way, a market where a lot of these companies can also make money, either charging fees or other types of ways that companies can get rich off of this particular scheme. Now, of course, the obvious solution, as I've said with everything else in this segment, is the government needs to spend lots and lots of money. But how does the government have to spend this money? So I've already talked about in different segments why a universal basic income makes sense. But 
You could also, or as it might be called in America, social security for all. One of the things that you could do is you could have, you could have it such that not only are people getting a universal basic income, but on top of that, you essentially get the opportunity to, once you reach a certain age, your UBI increases. So maybe every, you know, uh, when you hit 65, it increases by, you know, instead of getting $2,000 a month, you get $2,500 a month. You know, in, 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 and when you get to, when you get to, to 80, you know, it, it it increases to 3,000 a month or something like that. I don't have the exact numbers and I'm not sure that those numbers would particularly cover the very different types of expenses that you get when you're an, an older individual. But essentially, someone who has much more data available to them than I do would easily be able to figure out how much money it would take to allow someone on a UBI to retire on that UBI alone. There would need to be some increase, of course, because there wouldn't be supplemental income coming in, and of course, the prices would prices of things would increase, and of course, you need more services as you grow older. But there is a solution. The government can spend lots of money in order to create the, to create a situation where um, to create a situation where individuals are able to retire at a reasonable age and receive good money for the remainder of their days, and eliminate not only just like elder poverty but all poverty. But, of course, we would need to pass UBI first. In the meanwhile, the pension system is probably the best way to go. So if you're in a union, negotiate for a pension. Or find some way for your 401k to be guaranteed by the company you're working for. Because here's the thing about 401ks, and lots of people who retired in 2008 found this out the hard way. If the market crashes, you're fucked. There is nothing for you to do. You are in a very bad way. If for some reason you are unable to, um, if for some reason when you want to retire, the money's not there because sometimes the money just vanishes because that is the nature of the stock market, which has all sorts of problems with it that I'm really not feeling like getting into. So essentially, in order to shore up retirement in a way that is not as complicated as retirements tend to be right now, the solution is simple. And by the way, as I said in the beginning, the solution to all of these are simple. The government has to spend a ton of money. Okay? And these these this money that the government is spending also needs to come with tax increases on the rich. I didn't say that earlier, but it's true. And that's for other reasons. Don't think about it in modern, modern monetary terms. But essentially, to sum to sum it all up. Fox did a really good job of identifying five major financial issues that Americans face today and diagnosing the problem in, in very exquisite detail. And they really do a good job of their diagnosis. The problem becomes that they're not thinking about the solutions in terms of system changing. And when you don't think that way, you don't eliminate the underlying problem. I'm hoping that the solutions I gave you today show that I am thinking about it from a solutions-based perspective where you undermine the system that creates the problem in order to create a more permanent solution.